Hello and good afternoon everyone and on behalf of my flow colleagues welcome to this webinar entitled putting it all together the policy context of applying the flow tools it's being offered in the context of flow an EU horizon 2020 project that's running from 2015 to 2018 and we scheduled 90 minutes today including time for questions so we should be done by 3.30 Central European time. And also just so that you're aware, um, this webinar is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the Flow website so that others can refer to it and also so you can share it with your colleagues if you'd like. Uh, but first, just some basics before we get started. Uh, for those of you who are joining us um, by audio using your computer audio, that's great. But for those of you who are um, joining by phone, if you're using the phone, you'll need to enter uh, the PIN, which you see right here. Um, and so, yeah, if, uh, otherwise, if you ask a question, we won't be able to hear you. This will allow us to unmute you um, in case you have uh, any comments or questions. Okay, and then moving on, uh, speaking of comments and questions, uh, we have a number of opportunities for uh, interaction during this webinar today. Uh, first of all is uh, the default position, as I've said, is everybody is muted uh, during this webinar. So unless you would like to uh, participate verbally, then you can raise your hand and then uh, we will unmute you or uh, respond to you by written comments. And so at this point, I'd just like to ask everyone who's here to please raise your hand if you can hear me. And we can see some hands going up here. So that's, that's good, just testing this out. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so in addition to this, uh, if you wouldn't like to ask a verbal question, then you can also type your questions throughout the webinar, and we welcome you to do this at any point. And then my colleague, Hannah, who is managing the questions and polls, will respond to you, um, yeah, uh, and either answer them individually or share them with the group and answer them publicly if they're relevant to all. And then lastly, the, um, we'll be having a number of polls throughout the webinar. And uh, this is meant to gather your input and also to help you learn something about one another. So now that we know a bit about how to interface in this webinar, I'd like to introduce our webinar team. Uh, we have my colleague, Hannah Peters, who will be managing the questions and the polls. Uh, Cyrus Gomari, who is the technology manager sitting right in front of me. And my name is Kristen Tobas, and I will be the moderator today. And I'll also be giving an introduction to the Flow Project. And then as for our presenters, uh, for some reason there's animation on this, so I will just go through that. Okay, um, we have four presenters for today. from today. Uh, Luz is a development officer and Caroline is a senior project officer at the European Cyclist Federation where they help build communities to work together to promote cycling. Bronwyn is the development director at Walk21 um, specializing in policy, projects, and partnerships. And Rita is an ergonomist and program manager in the pedestrian accessibility plan team at the city of Lisbon. So now that you know a bit more about us, we would like to know more about you and who all is here. So we're going to launch our, um, our first poll. Um, I see that you're not able to see the change in slides, though. Is, is that correct? PowerPoint. Sorry, the PowerPoint's not visible. Okay. Oi. Okay. Sorry, we're having a technical difficulty with sharing my screen for some reason. Uh, At people the can moment, see my screen. poll should be visible, though. Okay, the poll is visible now. Okay, just a little hiccup. Um, okay, so what sort of organization do you represent? So you should see the possible answers there. You can just please uh, select the most relevant. 
response. Uh, votes are coming in. We have about 80% of you who have voted. Just give you a few more seconds for the rest. All right. Okay, good. And now we can share the results. Um, there it is. So it looks like we have a pretty good spread. 33% um, from NGOs. 25% uh, from local authorities and transport consultancies, and 17% other, no one from the commission. Um, okay, but good. Thank you all, and we're glad that you're all here. So welcome again. Um, so just moving on to give you a bit of context about this webinar. Um, this webinar is the third in the series that have been presented this year. Uh, for some reason, my screen is still not showing. <laughs> Sorry, um, I am sharing my screen, so that's really odd. Oh, sorry. There we are. I apologize for that. Okay. Now you should be seeing it, is that right? It's all good? Okay, good. <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, okay, so yes, this is the, the third in a series um, that have been presented this year. Uh, each webinar is accompanied by a four-week online course, and this one will start on Monday. So registration is still up uh, for that, and you'll be learning a bit more about how you can register at the end of this webinar. Um, Okay, so then just moving along to our agenda for the day, uh, we have coming up an introduction to flow, um, a presentation from our colleagues at the European Cyclist Federation, understanding your policy context and how to influence it, um, and then uh, 10 minutes for a question and discussion, and then we'll hand it over to Bronwyn at Walk21 for an introduction to the flow tools. Um, and then over to Rita uh, for a case example of assessing the impact of pedestrian improvements in Lisbon. And then finally back over to Bronwyn uh, for applying the flow tools, ado adopting a multimodal approach to decision making. And finally we have allowed uh, about 20 minutes at the end of the webinar for questions and discussion. So. Uh, just to give you a brief background now uh, on flow and what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, basically, we're aware of many tools that look at interactive modes of transport for their health and environmental benefits. Um, and more recently, tools have been developed to measure the economic benefits of non-motorized transport through local shopping and strengthened neighborhoods. But until now, nobody has looked at the transport benefits of walking and cycling, and specifically, what is their effect on the performance of traffic flow? Well, the benefits are that we can develop transport-related arguments for sustainable mobility, and since it's the transport budget that is spent on walking and cycling, it's a good place to address. So what flow has done over the past two and a half years has been to try and bring two worlds together that we think are actually meant to be together. Uh, on the one hand, we have uh, transport planners and local authorities working with transport models. This informs decision making and determines action. And at the same time, cycling and walking are playing a larger role in people's transport choices. And so this is becoming um, a larger uh, issue, but it's not always so simple to bring these two parts together. Um, not everybody takes motorized modes seriously, and they don't always seem to count. And the lack of available techniques to analyze the impacts of walking and cycling measures on congestion has, in turn, often led decision makers to dismiss such measures as a means to address congestion. So the legacy of flow is that we've brought together the two worlds at one table but there's still a lot to do until there is a happily ever after. Um, but what we have achieved is we brought together uh, from these two worlds, PTB, 
for the transport modeling side, and the European Cyclist Federation and Walk 21 from the policy side and walking and cycling. Um, and in addition to our other partners, which we, you see here, and our partner cities, we've also brought in nine exchange cities, 25 follower cities, and some uh, representatives from consultancies who have also been working with the flow tools and learning more about them. So again, over the past two and a half years, we've had a number of challenges that we've had to address in flow. Um, First of all, defining congestion, uh, pedestrian and cyclist congestion. Uh, what does this look like? And what is our starting point with that? Uh, there's also the very big issue of the lack of data for pedestrians and cyclists. And just simply modeling human behavior isn't easy. Furthermore, proving that congestion reduction is caused by walking or uh, cycling measures is also a tricky one, which we've tried to address. And lastly, uh, in more of a, a policy um, angle, there is there does tend to be a cultural bias toward motorized transport and also a lack of political understanding and support for integrating walking and cycling um, into measures for reducing congestion. So one of the first questions that we had to ask ourselves is actually what is multimodal congestion? Uh, this is probably uh, one of the first things that we often think of with motorized transport, but what about other modes? What about uh, a heavily trafficked cycling path? Uh, what about a heavily trafficked footpath? Is this congestion and how do we measure it? How do we assess it? And in this scenario, is this considered uh, traffic congestion when we have one lone cyclist probably smiling to himself behind his breathing mask uh, next to all this motorized traffic. So these are the questions that we started out asking ourselves. And to address the technical component of this, Flow has developed a portfolio of tools which can be used to assess walking and cycling measures for their impacts on congestion, as well as their wider, wider societal, environmental, and economic impacts. And so we've been working together with transport planners, decision makers, and consultancies across Europe to fine tune these tools and to ensure their usability and take up in their everyday work. But this requires a transition process and it also requires some political convincing. And so to address the political component, Flow has produced a number of resources, including a portfolio of measures where cycling and walking uh, measures were successfully implemented to reduce congestion. We also have 15 quick facts for cities. And we have an animated video which sums up very neatly the technical and political um, aspects of flow and, and how you can use these tools, how they can in inform decision makers. So now that you understand uh, a bit more of the background about flow, um, before I hand it over to uh, Caroline and Luce, I'll just ask briefly if there are any questions or comments. And Hannah, you can just let me know if any of them have come in. No, no one's written anything yet, and I don't see any hands raised. So unless anyone raises their hand now, I would say... We can hand it over. <laughs> okay, great. Then I will hand it over to Caroline and Luce. Yes, hello everybody. My name is Caroline and I work for the European Cyclist Federation. In uh, our presentation, me and my colleague Luz, we will talk to you about the setting the policy context, how you can actually understand your local policy context and things you can do to influence it. So I will be talking to you guys about uh, understanding your policy context. And within the Flow project, we actually did a survey uh, amongst a list of decision makers. In the end, we uh, interviewed 100 decision, decision makers across, across Europe. And the survey confirmed to us that decision makers in Europe believe that congestion is indeed an important issue and that it's actually high on their agenda. 
It was also confirmed that decision makers are worried about congestion whenever they are introducing new cycling or walking measures in their cities. And we also learned, or our initial hypothesis was confirmed, that they do not consider walking and cycling to be on the level playing field with other transport modes when it comes to addressing congestion. Um, we did, however, also notice uh, some additional findings in um, our survey. And one was that, in fact, decision makers have a lot of uh, different priorities to deal with when they're um, making policy in their, in their city or in their region. And as you can see in this graph, congestion is one of the many uh, challenges they're facing with regard to urban transport. So it's important to keep this in mind whenever you're uh, working with your decision makers. They have a lot of issues. Uh, another initiative um, which was high on the agenda for uh, decision makers we noticed to be uh, public transport which is also very important to note uh, that we somehow have to incorporate this when we want to convince dec decision makers of walking and cycling measures as a solution for congestion. The good news however from the survey was that even in cases when decision makers are worried about uh, congestion, that they were still introducing cycling and walking measures, as you can, as you can see from this graph. So that was a, a positive note um, to end with also, that even though decision makers might be afraid about, about introducing walking and cycling measures and the impact on congestion, they're doing it anyway. So this is a bit of a first introduction to the uh, policy context within, within the FLOW projects. And now my colleague Luz will tell you about what things you can do to actually go out and influence your decision makers. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Luz Holtmaat and I also work for the European Cyclist Federation. Um, so after completing uh, your survey, you, you know your city has a congestion problem. But how then, uh, how do you know if your city is ready to implement solutions uh, for that congestion problem? And this is actually about understanding uh, uh, policy, policy decisions and policy influencing. Uh, so you can ask yourself the question, looking at cities, because they are constantly evolving. Uh, who influenced the change? Uh, who made it happen? Why do some fantastic policies not happen? And why do some other policies that are not expected to happen suddenly become a top priority for policymakers? Um, well, understanding the policy making, how can you also check if your policymakers are really ready to implement the policy initiative you suggest? And if they are not ready, what can you do? Uh, we call this the how. Research shows us that uh, you need to have actually uh, three uh, ingredients in place uh, for policies that are to be adopted. And the first one is that you need to have a problem in place, a recognized um, and shared public problem that also can be addressed by a public body. The, the second one is you need to have a clear and realistic policy solution in place a proposal that can be delivered in time and uh, is affordable as well. And the third one is the political will of the key influencers should be there. Um, the right political intentions, uh, personal endorsement by your stakeholders. And uh, if, if you don't have at least two out of these three in place, um, policies will not happen. So what happens then? Uh, so ask yourself the questions. Is there in my city or region a recognized problem and, and a shared conclusion that, should, that congestion is a problem and has to be fixed? Can the flow tools be used to set out as a policy solution? And can I, can I demonstrate the congestion effects of cycling and walking measures in my city? Do I have something ready uh, that is available and deliverable in time? And is the political community in which I am working behind me? Do I have uh, my networks, uh, are they supportive? Are they well informed? So am I ready? Um, but if you're not ready, what should you do? And if your city is not ready to implement, how can you get ready? Well, a lot of things you can, there are a lot of things you can do. For instance, 
go talk to your boss, go collect data, make a project planning, including uh, projects in your budget, organize workshop events, hold consultations. And uh, we actually call all of these things all together, we call them advocacy. And advocacy is a political process by an individual or a large group, which normally aims to influence public policy and resource allocation decisions within political, economic and social systems. And it doesn't matter whether it's an internal lobbying by staff members to influence uh, political decisions or budgets within your organization or whether it's understanding big external waves in society. So then we go to the uh, first poll question and you should you start by asking yourself, am I ready? And the first poll question addresses this. Um, you should check which of the three policy changing ingredients is already in place in your uh, city or region. And you can, uh, you can uh, apply for multiple answers, but you should check, it, do I have at least two out of three in place or not? And I think now it's time to answer the poll question. Yes, so we have 50% have voted so far. Yeah, we'll just give it a few more seconds for them to bring it in. Okay, almost at 70%. We'll close it out in a few seconds, so please submit your response now. Okay, I think we can close the poll and show the results. So, yeah. so here we can see uh, from the uh, results that um, most of you have a problem in place, 82%, but that the political solution and the political will are often not there yet. So that means that only one of the out of three is in place and that means actually you're not ready. So. You, if you uh, if you go to the to the second poll question uh, and you just answered the first one uh, by answering just one out of three, you should ask yourself: Are you really ready to implement uh, cycling and walking measures to reduce congestion in your city, or are you not? And I give you some time now to answer the question again. Okay, we have 70% have completed. Give it a couple more seconds. Okay, now we can close the poll and show the results. So, I think the results are showing 35% of you think you're ready. Um, and that at least two out of the three uh, of the former questions are in place of the ingredients. So, and for the persons that are not ready that said no, I think it's really a uh, really good thing to uh, join our also our e-course, our e-learning, where you will learn a lot more about getting ready to influence your uh, policy makers. Yeah, yeah. I think the results of this poll. Thank you, Los and and Caroline. Um, the results are interesting because it, it looked like, uh, for the most part, respondents. You know, they said uh, we only really have one of these, and yet um, a much more even number actually said yes, we're ready, or no, we're not ready. Um, a couple actually said they're not sure, which I'm curious what the reasons are uh, for that. If you guys would like to type your answers in or raise your hand, you'd like to share anything um, about that. But I have a follow-up question actually for, for both of you. And uh, as we wait for some more uh, questions to come in, um, in your experience, is which of the um, areas have cities uh, typically been most prepared uh, for? Is it about the same as the results that we had here? Usually the problem, yeah. uh, because, well, you usually start by 
changing policy because of a problem in that, that occurs in a city, but the problem is with the problem <laughs> that um, sometimes you look at it in a, in, a, at it in a different way because if you recognize, for instance, uh, healthcare as a, as a big problem, uh, you say, yeah, if people don't go cycling and walking, but instead taking the car, it, it really has a negative effect on, on the health of people, and this has an effect also on the economy, etc. But um, that might not be uh, the case, that policymakers in your city think health is a big issue, but they are more focused, one way or the other, on, uh, on the air quality. So instead of focusing then on the health problem, which is a problem, focus on the air quality problem because then it's easier to change your policy and to get your political will because uh, politicians in your city focus on the, on the air quality, use that when, when, when you want to change uh, the policy in your city. Hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if we have any questions from the audience. Hannah, have we received any? Any uh, typed questions or any hands raised? No, no, no hands are up, and no one has written any questions yet. I think everyone is looking forward for the e-course. Yeah, <laughs> we'll be learning a lot more in depth about this and sort of the theoretical underpinnings of it. So it'll be very interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm actually wondering. I mean, we have a bit of time for discussion. Um, would you say it's sort of a, a stepwise approach, so if, if the acknowledgement of the problem actually isn't there, a common problem, is it possible to also, you know, agree on a solution uh, and, uh, and, you know, proceed to steps two and three? Uh, in your experience, I think, uh, if, if, anyway? if yeah. you have a solution in place for something that isn't a problem yet, you can of course influence uh, by the thing we call advocacy on one way or the other, you can influence your uh, policy makers and, and also the media to, uh, to make sure there, there will be a problem for your solution. Mm -hmm. And we, we also say that the, the three ingredients that Luz presented, you always have to have at least two out of three. So in the case where maybe the problem isn't recognized as such by society or by decision makers, but and on the other hand, you do have a, an already available policy solution, and you have the political will and commitment of your decision makers to go, to actually go out and do it. Then, I mean, then things might happen, of course, because you have two out of the three ingredients in place, okay. even though without having the actual problem as such recognized. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. The biggest Carolina. impact, yeah, where, yeah, all three converge, where yeah. where you actually have the three elements coming together, yeah. where you have and the problem yeah. and the solution and the political will to back it up. Yeah, and where the problem is also uh, recognized by the public. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Any other questions for Caroline and Luz? If not, um, feel free, if you think of anything later, we do still have time at the end of the webinar to discuss any of the presentations further. So um, for now, I'll just say thank you very much for presenting this. And uh, now we can hand it over to Bronwyn at Walk 21 for her presentation. Hello, I'm just making, there we are. Is that everything set up? You yes. can see my slide and you can see me and everything? Yes, that's all. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so what I'm, oops, sorry, here we are. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about now is a little bit about bringing together uh, these political dimensions and the technical dimensions of the FLOW project. Kristen's already said, We've been bringing walking and cycling into the conversation about congestion, but we've also been marrying together this idea that you need to have the political and the technical uh, processes running in parallel and drawing um, on each other to enable 
a multimodal approach to some of these solutions. So historically, cities have understood and evaluated congestion from a very motorised transport perspective. As you can see in one of these images, we would all naturally default to thinking about congestion in that way. Um, more recently, cities like Copenhagen have had to struggle with cycling congestion and we're starting to see pedestrian congestion as a potential um, challenge for cities as well. And how we understand and consider what those uh, issues are and how we might solve them influences um, how we ask questions about them and how we seek the technical support. And we've heard already that often political decision makers or decision makers want to do something differently and the technicians are like, oh, it can't be done, transport systems, we think about it in this way. So what we've sought to do through the flow tools, and I'm going to talk about these three uh, tools to support decision making, is bring together some traditional transport system approaches and introducing walking and cycling into that framework. What we've also got is um, integrating the transport benefits as well as the broader social benefits and impacts of transport decisions. Historically, transport systems only assess transport impacts. And this is where walking and cycling have fallen over because if travel time is your measure of success, then walking tends to be a bit slow for that. But if you are wanting a system, and as a decision maker, you're wanting a system that answers a range of questions for you and brings those broader benefits to play, then you want uh, that, it, that integrated with the transport decision making as well. And lastly, our transport modelling tool uh, brings walking and cycling into those macro and micro simulations that are possible. I'm going to talk a bit more about the multimodal congestion assessment tool after our Lisbon case study and I'm going to also talk about modelling and how these two tools are being integrated into decision making. So just a little bit more about the impact assessment tool because this is the example that we have um, from Lisbon. And what is fantastic about this is uh, for a long time now walking and cycling have been valued for their health benefits and we've had the health impact assessment tools developed by the World Health Organization but this is where transport tools are actually integrating those broader benefits into an analysis of the transport system. And we can see this uh, in the Lisbon example. Also environmental benefits, especially with the climate talks happening in Bonn this week, what are the air quality, the noise, the pollution um, impacts of our transport decisions? What are the economic impacts for our local economies, for our streets? And what are the social impacts both on our so social cohesion as well as our local neighbourhoods and sense of belonging. So I'm going to hand over to Lisbon and Reid is going to share their case study about the impact assessment tool and then I'll talk a little bit more at the end um, about these other two tools and how you can use them to uh, think about congestion in your city differently. Hi everyone, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, <laughs> so I'm Rita from the Lisbon City Council and I will talk to you today about case study of Lisbon. Uh, we're part of the Flow project with partners and uh, we've used the impact assessment tool and I'm going to tell you about one of our measure sites. So, um, we'll talk about the site and what our goals were for that specific site, what we wanted to improve in that area, how we achieved it. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how we used the tool, so what sort of data we gathered from the model and from other sources. Um, I'll show you some of the results and then we'll have a bit of a quick discussion in the end and I hope to hear from you as well. So. One of our sites here in Lisbon was the street Alexandre Herculano. Uh, it's actually the street where I work at, so it was very convenient. 
and uh, what we wanted to do. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry, I skipped that one. But um, what we wanted to do is to improve uh, green time for pedestrians to cross the road. And on your screen now, you can see where the street is. So you have the center down uh, close to the river, and in red, you can see where the street is located. OK. So as I was saying, we had two major calls here. So provide enough time for pedestrians to cross safely. Um, without worsening traffic congestion. And uh, we also, uh, to improve safety, we didn't want to have what we call a double green. So green time for vehicles at the same time that you have green time for pedestrians to cross the road. And this happens when vehicles can turn left or right. So you can either give more green time, you can change the lights. We worked a bit with a few scenarios and I'll show you in a bit. Okay, and how did we go about doing that? So we thought, okay, we can uh, change the infrastructure and we can change the green, <clears throat> the green light time for pedestrians. Um, I'll show you how we change the infrastructure in a bit. <clears throat> Sorry, so what did we do here? We defined several scenarios um, for this area. So how do we want to change? Do we change the road? Do we change the sidewalk? Just just the green light times, we defined a few ones. We conducted traffic and pedestrian counts on all sides. And why this is important? Because to model the area, you need all this data, several types of data, promote pedestrian cycling, not just motorized traffic. And after uh, modeling for several scenarios, we extracted the data. And with the data from the model, we filled in the impact assessment tool and we compared the results for several scenarios. And this is why the tool is so important, because as uh, Bronwyn was saying, it brings together a lot of variables, environmental, economic, and it puts uh, walking and cycling at the same level as motorized traffic. And you can compare the results with all these variables in just one tool. Okay, so to show you what we did. So this is the street we were working on and that we defined the scenarios. I'm going to quickly show you two of the scenarios, what we thought of doing. Okay, for scenario A, so what the area that you see in red was road and this scenario we thought, okay, this area will become a sidewalk. So what will happen is that people cross the road, the distance becomes much smaller, okay? So you act on bottlenecks and curve radius. Comparing with scenario B, you do that, but you also change the green light time for pedestrians. And we compare to see, okay, how does scenario A work and how does scenario B work? And how did they do? Um, I wanted to ask, I uh, wanted to run the first poll before I move forward. And maybe Hannah, you can turn, uh, question number one. Okay, so the question is launched. Is launched? Okay, so the question is how does, uh, if your city council uh, models motorized traffic and soft modes? So if yes for both, yes for just for motorized traffic, just for soft modes, or no, or you don't know. Okay, we have about 71% have voted. <clears throat> if you haven't voted yet, then please submit and we'll close the poll in a few seconds. Okay. okay. Good. We can close and show the results. Okay, so we can see that the largest percentage is yes, but just motorized traffic. So that's 45%. And then followed by I don't know by it's 35%. 10% <clears throat> um, said no. <coughs> and 5% each said yes, both. And yes, but just soft modes, cycling and walking. 
Uh, can you please remind me uh, the, the percentage for yes for both? A yes for both is 5%. Okay. So the majority is just for motorized traffic? Yes. 45%? Yeah. By far. Okay, yes. So this is, uh, I just wanted to emphasize here uh, why the impact assessment tool is so uh, unique and important because the data from modeling pedestrians and modeling soft modes and cycling comes in the same tool as, um, oh, let me just save myself from the screen. Okay. Um, so that's why it's so important because it brings uh, these soft modes to the same level as motorized traffic. Okay. Um, so going back to the um, measure that I was telling you about. So when we acted on the bottlenecks and the curved radios, this is the before scenario. So pedestrians had to cross about, um, can everyone see me? I'm having yeah. a strange notice here. Okay. So pedestrians had to cross 18 meters. Okay. And the after scenario, okay. So this is what we did. You have to cross only 5.5 meters more or less. So, this is, this is a special situation because we've done construction after already. So, just to compare side by side um, what we did. Okay, so we have other scenarios, but for this case study, I'm showing you just two because they're quite um, easy to compare. Okay, and we also acted on the green light times, and I'll show you the results at the end. So after modeling um, the several scenarios with uh, Vicine and the help of uh, PTV, uh, we extracted the data from the models to fill in the tool and uh, we went through this target system. So we had data for what we call society, data for public financing, for economic aspects, for transport and for the environment. I'm just going to quickly show you a few examples of what that data really is. So for the society, target system, we collected data for runovers and collisions. So what sort of accidents, were there light injuries, were there uh, severe injuries in that area? And I just copy pasted here a bit so you have an idea how the tool looks like. I put uh, um, here just if there were any uh, deaths, but there were none in this site, uh, fortunately. And for the scenarios, you have to project what you think the change will be. Okay, so we consulted with a few experts and in the Lisbon case, we project that that there will be at least 20% less accidents, runovers and collisions, uh, both for severe injuries and light injuries. But this is something that your local authority has to uh, project and has to consult with specialists. Okay, so for public financing, in the Lisbon case, it was mainly construction costs that we had. So again, this is just an example of uh, our own costs and how to fill in the tool, okay. For the attractiveness, okay, in this case, Lisbon um, didn't consider this target system and I will explain you why. Um, this addresses the real estate impact, but in our particular case, prices uh, for housing and for real estate and commercial things are increasing a lot, but due to other variables. So for the sake of the tool, we considered zero because we thought it was not an important and uh, variable here because we couldn't really assess um, how much it was impacting. Okay, and for transport uh, performance and environment, the data that you extract from the modeling, um, it, you, you will fit in the tool for a lot of things. So I give uh, an example, um, sorry further ahead, for instance, depending on the type of vehicles you have in the area, the type of fuel, the speed, the travel times, and travel times is again calculated by the model, um, the tool will tell you environmental costs. How much time do you lose in traffic? What sort of pollutions? What sort of emissions? So the modeling will tell you um, travel times and the tool calculates that automatically. You don't have to do it, you just put the data and the tool has all those formulas behind. Okay. 
Okay, so just to summarize what sort of data we used, we used model data for the environment and transport performance and economic, for instance, energy consumption, and we used other data. We had to look for uh, injuries data, we had to look for public financing data, quality assessments, those sorts of things. Okay, and now maybe we could run poll number two, please. Okay, so the poll is running. Okay, so I was curious because we had some difficulties with it and it was just to share our experience if your city council has easy access to traffic injuries data such as runovers, collisions, where they happen, what sorts of uh, severity they cause in the uh, injury. So it's yes, but you can take a while to get it because another organization perhaps has that information or no, or uh, you have easy access to it, or you don't, or you don't know. Okay, we have 74% who have voted. We'll just <clears throat> leave it open a couple more seconds. Okay. Okay. Seems like that's what we'll get, so we'll show the results. And we have 24% said yes, but it takes a while to get it. 29% right. said yes, it's, and they have easy access to it. 12% um, said no, and 35% said I don't know. You don't know, okay. So from our uh, experience here in Lisbon, this is very key to have access to this data because even to convince within your own organization how to change things and how things are done, if you have the hard data and say, look, these sort of accidents happen here, we've recorded that, that's extremely important. From our own experience here in this case um, for Lisbon. So we had some difficulties at the beginning, but we gathered all the data that was necessary. So moving on to the results uh, of the impact assessment tool, and this was for the cost-benefit analysis. So for scenario A, where we only did infrastructural change, so we changed the curve radius, as you saw a while ago, we, there was a very good result, so 12.22, and that's the scenario that we have today, so that's good. <laughs> And anything above five, it's a very good result in terms of benefit cost ratio. But with scenario B, we didn't have a good result. And why? So in our case, because the green light time for pedestrians was increased so much that it caused um, more congestion on motorized vehicles. And that uh, with the extract not nothing. So the twelve point twenty five for the first scenario. Sorry, Rita, can and you just negative result for scenario B. So this is something we have to Sorry, there there was a bit of a cutout Sorry? there. I just want to be sure that everybody heard what you said. So um, oh. you can just back up a bit to the part where you discuss the the scenario B result. Uh, the last thing that you said about scenario that. B. Oh, sorry. Um, so in scenario B, we have infrastructural change, and we also changed the green light time for pedestrians. So the time was um, it, it was provided much more time for pedestrians to cross the road. So in scenario A, by changing the infrastructure, even if you keep the same amount of time, because instead of walking 18 meters, you only walk in five it's like you have more time because it's a smaller distance. But with scenario B, the lights were really changed. And because the green light time for pedestrians was much higher, it caused a few delays for motorized traffic. And that data extracted from the model that went into the impact assessment tool but by monetizing everything. So you monetize the time you wait, it gave a negative result. Okay, so this is something we're working on. We opted for scenario A in construction. We haven't changed the green line time accordingly, but this is something we're discussing. Okay, so just to show you why you can have negative results. So in this case, because 
this scenario caused more delays for motorized traffic. Okay. Um, I would like now to run, okay, so now why the negative result for that scenario B? So that's why, because it caused delays for motorized traffic. So run poll number three. Okay, so the poll is open. And I can read the uh, question for those of you. So, oh, uh, so <laughs> or you can. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, would your city be interested in using the impact assessment tool before implementing measures to tackle traffic congestion? Okay. So, yes, you would be interested, no, or you don't know. Okay. Still looking for a few more votes. Leave it open for a couple seconds. Okay, seems like that's uh, all the results we'll get. So, uh, it looks like we have 31% said yes, they would be interested in using the impact assessment tool before implementing measures to tackle traffic congestion specifically. 6% uh, said no. And 63% said, I don't know. So it seems like um, maybe you'd like some more information about the impact assessment tool. Uh, that might be the case. I mean, you know, you've seen this one example is a very specific example, um, illustrated very clearly. But uh, if you'd like more information, we actually do have a course, um, a previous course, which is still publicly available to you on Mobility Academy, where you can learn in much more detail about the impact assessment tool and uh, actually work through it hands-on. Um, so I can just say, if, if you're interested, then uh, okay. at the end of this webinar, I'll, I'll let you guys know how to register there. Yes, I think that would be great for those listening out there. So if I have, uh, I don't know if I have enough time for uh, not to run another poll before my last slide. Sure. Sure, okay. So this would be um, the same question, but now, in terms of soft mode, so would your city be interested in using the impact assessment tool before implementing measures to promote soft modes? So now using the tool before implementing cycling and walking measures. Yeah. So it could be to have an area with shared space, you could create a new cycling lane, it could be something to improve pedestrian safety, it could be to tackle congestion, um, specifically, so many options. And again, the same um, answers, yes, no, or you don't know. Okay. So, as we're waiting for these answers to come in, uh, I'm sure you guys know what the follow-up question is for this. Um, and that would be <laughs> <laughs> sort of, uh, why would there be a difference in your answer? Uh, I think we can close the poll now and see the results and see the discrepancy between the first poll and the second poll. Or, yeah, right. okay. So uh, we have 53% said that yes, they would uh, use the impact assessment tool for implementing um, soft mode measures. Um, so that's much higher right. than before. 13% uh, said no. And 33% said, I don't know. So this time we got a more positive response specifically for cycling and walking measures. Um, yes. If any of you would like to let us know why, um, why the different response between uh, the two polls, uh, in what context you might use it in your city, that would, I think could be interesting for discussion. We can either discuss it now or at the end after after these presentations. Maybe I'll just go through my last slide and we can yeah. open a discussion for everyone of the yeah, yeah. sound. Sure, yeah, I can do that. Okay, great. Um, so, after having this result, and I'm just showing you two scenarios, we have four scenarios for this area. Um, things are not pro always perfect in the process, so we realized we had to pay attention to other issues as well, I'm going to open the discussion 
So we are still working on it on other um, measure sites here in Lisbon. So how can we work um, to have data that we can use for modeling on uh, changes that can happen in modal share, traffic volumes, and pedestrian use of public space? Uh, when you change a certain area and you make it more pleasant for pedestrians or you create cycling lanes, you somehow need to have some information on how the use of the area is going to change and it has to go into your modeling so you can have the most reliable possible data that you can extract that data to use on the tool. So we don't have perfect answers at the moment, we're working on it. If any of you are working on it, please will we love to hear from you how you're working on this and what sort of information you have. So this is what we're doing right now for our other sites so that we can choose the best scenario before we go through uh, construction. And um, I welcome any emails or questions you can have at the end and um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Rita. So at this point we can pass it on back to Bronwyn for a bit more information about applying the flow tools in the political context for that. Up, oh, Bronwyn, we can't hear you. <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay, um, I want to talk a little bit more about um, applying the tools and just to remind us, um, we had, uh, we just had a bit more of an understanding of how you integrate other issues into a transport uh, decision uh, with the flow impact assessment tool. Uh, the one I want to talk about initially, um, and we have the multimodal analysis methodology and we have modelling. So very often it's like, well, which tool do we choose? Do we have to use all of them? What answers do these different tools give us? Because very often, if you're not the technician using the tool, but you're the person who wants to understand the system, it's the question you ask that determines the answer uh, that you get. So transport system performance tools generally answer questions about how can we quantify what we term congestion? How do we measure it? How do we know that we've actually got congestion? Um, and what are those tools for measuring it? And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Transport models actually help us predict what will happen if we change something. So we can put different variables into a transport model and see those results. Um, so if we change a street layout like you've seen in Lisbon, uh, how will that impact on traffic movement? And then the impact assessment tool, which you've just heard about, helps us evaluate our options in robust and transparent ways and bring those broader impacts in, as we've talked about. So it's always, it sounds silly, but the question you ask will determine the answer and the tool that you seek to answer those questions. So transport system performance, I'm not a transport planner, so I can't talk about this from a technical perspective, but there's some critical factors that you need to understand. Essentially, transport fit, it, it, there's a few measures. One is, what is the demand on the space relative to the space that's available? And what is the amount of delay relative to what's perceived as an expected journey speed if there was no blockages by sheer volume of other traffic in the way? And then the level of service is quantitative measures um, to get a standardised form. And then that determines whether you, what level of service you can provide on different network elements. But the things I want to talk about is demand and delay. Because what we're trying to do at Flow is to look at things differently. So what if we took this vehicle-centred approach and applied it to pedestrian movement? So in Sydney, Australia, it's, uh, I'm bringing uh, an example from there. They finally measured walking in their CBD. Data, this shows up how important data is. And what they found was that de the demand on the space was that 92% of journeys in the central business district are walked journeys. But here's the killer statistic. 52% of journey time is spent waiting to cross the road which is delay. So in a traditional transport model, you have incredibly high demand in the space and very poor um, uh, 
performance of the system in terms of journey time because 52% of a journey is spent standing still like these poor chaps here in, the, in Australia. That's actually Melbourne, which confuses you, I appreciate, with Sydney, but it's such a great image of people stuck to the spot waiting to uh, cross the road. Now we haven't historically considered pedestrian waiting time to cross the road as a congestion issue or a journey time issue because we prioritised uh, motorised traffic. But what if we did model people instead of vehicles? What if we did take this approach? And this is where our Dublin city, partner city, um, has done a very interesting process. And the things to remember with Dublin, building on what you've been hearing about in this webinar, is that they got some data together. They had a broader political dynamic going on which gave them the political courage to even consider modelling something quite radical and quite different to what they had been um, thinking about. So instead of counting the number of vehicles that they could move through this intersection, they counted people. And what they came up with, as you can see on your screen, and I don't know if you can see my mouse moving, I, I'll just check that you can. Um, yes, we can see it. Thank you. So this area here is now proposed to be a pedestrian plaza. This is a public space solution to a transport challenge. Instead of continuing it to be road space, they'd modeled all of this as road space and continued it to be road space. It wasn't answering the question they needed, which was managing intense congestion in this part of Dublin. It's a very famous part of Dublin. This is Trinity College. It's a very popular tourist spot. This is a, an important bank, but this is also where, when they have significant people come to Dublin, Obama, Barack Obama when he was president, the Pope, people like this, this is where they address the crowd. And so what they did with the modelling was decided to model people in this space instead of just vehicle movement. And what they found out was this, that if they actually introduced public square, they could improve the transport performance of this part of the city by moving 700 more people during rush hour. Now this is a great result because, as I said, Dublin had the data, critical factor, they also had the political will to actually run with the idea. And I think that's what's really interesting. And then with the modelling, it gave them the courage to go public with the idea because they knew that they had a positive uh, response to the questions that needed to be answered. So when we start thinking about answering a question like congestion, perhaps a better way to think about it, and some of you will have seen these ideas, is congestion versus corridor capacity. If we don't want to just keep building out and making wider and wider roads to accommodate our vehicle movements, we have to think about moving people and people in other modes other than private motorised car. So the picture on the left, you can see there's a bike lane, there's a sidewalk, there's cars, and, uh, well, I mean, the cars are blocked up, but there's plenty of space if you were on a bicycle to move through that. The image on the right is from the Global Street Design Guide, and it shows the difference in capacity for a corridor if you turn it into a multimodal corridor. And you can see it's a shift of 12,500 people per hour to 30,000 people per hour. Now, that includes a public transport option, which isn't part of the flow tools, but the message is the same. If we start thinking about the space between buildings and our street space differently, then we can start imagining much more efficient and effective options for moving people uh, around our cities. And I think that's what's so exciting about flow, is it helps us ask the right questions, it helps us think about our systems differently, it helps us integrate our transport decisions more broadly across all of the decisions that policy that people are struggling with within a policy context. And so to, to try and help make this a little bit easier for, our, for decision makers and some communication tools for people to bring to their decision makers um, and to share with each other and to take a confidence to try doing things a bit differently, uh, we developed a, a range of tools. And one of the, the reasons that we've developed up our quick facts for cities is because people are still struggling with answering motor vehicle congestion without, and, and are worried about that. We've heard that from Caroline in our survey. So the quick facts, walking, cycling and congestion, no plainer than that really. And it's a really great collection of ideas for cities. 
So you've seen the Dublin example already, and this is the example from Lisbon captured as a quick fact, because it's not just that actually Dublin says you can improve people movement through your uh, intersection with a multimodal approach. The Lisbon example says that you can make improvements for pedestrians without increasing congestion, which is also a valid uh, factor that people are worried about. Um, and you also, by improving pedestrian movements, you can also reduce bus travel time, which makes the appeal of your public transport systems more attractive as well. So there's 15 quick facts. I've shared three with you because we don't um, have all day to run through all of them. But what these quick facts do is enable that communication to share the answers and to give a confidence, potentially make slightly more uh, controversial decisions. So let's make those invisible cyclists and walkers more visible and more apparent in our system. Uh, this is another tool that we've provided for you, which is the role of walking and cycling in reducing congestion. And there's a range of uh, more detail about some projects which have improved things for walking and cycling or actively use walking and cycling to reduce congestion. So another set of examples to draw down on for opening the conversation um, with either your decision makers or if your practitioners need um, a different perspective on how to use the tools that they have available or to seek new ways of using those tools. You can find them all. There's the Flow website. It's uh, the font of lots of lovely information about the project and lots of different political and technical support so that walkers and cyclists can become more visible. Um, not just on our streets, as they already are, but within the transport tools and systems that we use to make decisions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Brownman. And do we have any questions? Well, now we can actually move into the main um, discussion round. Uh, so it's open to you if you have any questions related to Bronwyn's presentation or any of the others earlier in the webinar, then we'll be happy to take those now. If anyone wants to raise their hand and uh, say their question um, out loud. Uh, Kristen, can I add something to it? Sure, yes. Rita. Um, so when in the, uh, while we're running the poll, so the use of the impact assessment tool, um, the answer was much higher for using it to promote soft modes such as cycling and walking um, than just to tackle traffic congestion and perhaps thinking about motorized vehicles only. So maybe some of you have answered yes for one and no for the other. If you want to just share with us your ideas, I think that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. You can either raise your hand or uh, type your response if you would like. Okay. I'm not sure if we're getting any questions in. No, nothing. But actually, um, we may have time for even two more poll questions that might spark more discussion. Um, I know we have, uh, and it's our last two actually, uh, so if you would be all right with launching another poll, um, we can do the, the last one. So um, when thinking about a traffic challenge, which of these modes do you consider as part of the problem? And you can take all that apply. Okay, we have about 20%, 25% that have voted. That's why people are voting as well, it's Bronwyn. I just wanted to say that we explore the tools and how to integrate them with decision making um, much more in parts three and four of the uh, e-learning course. So once again, if you want more, more um, Exploration, please, you can join us in a couple of weeks for those modules. Yes, that's right. 
Okay, well, 75% about have voted, so I think we can close the poll and show the results. And <laughs> um, it's quite a split, so 100% uh, of respondents said that cars and motorbikes are uh, part of the problem. That's not surprising. 57% uh, said buses and trams, interestingly, uh, as the second largest contributor to the problem. 36% um, said bicycles and 29% said walking. So um, we can have a, a brief discussion now if you would like about um, your answer to this question, uh, specifically buses and trams. Uh, it, it seems like the concern is more related to public transport if we're talking about sustainable modes rather than uh, cycling and walking. So if anybody has a comment related to that, you can type that in or hand, raise your hand now. Um, yeah, I'd be interested even in just a, a comment, even if people don't want to say it, yeah. uh, ask a question. Um, on what base, in what way does, I mean, bicycles get a lot of rap because they you create bike lanes, which, but in what way is walking, if, forgive my bias, uh, in what way is walking become part of the problem? Is it just delay at traffic lights? Or is there something else where in, in, your, in your communities where walking is part of the problem? I'd, really, I'd be genuinely interested to know, other than delay at traffic lights, if there was something else. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, we'll give you a moment to type those comments. Um, but for comparison, we have a, the final poll question of the webinar. And we can launch that now. OK, so when thinking about a traffic challenge, again, which of these modes do you consider as part of the solution? So again, we have cars or motorbikes, buses and trams, bicycles and walking. I fear that putting this at the end will have biased their responses, but it'll be interesting. Mm. <laughs> be honest, it's totally anonymous, so. <laughs> Okay, just a few more seconds. We have about 70% who have voted. Okay, seems like that's it. So we can close the poll and show the results. And it seems to be almost inverse. So 17% uh, actually said that cars and motorbikes can be part of the solution. 92% uh, said buses and trams. 100% said bicycles. And 92% said walking. So there's an interesting discrepancy there, too, between um, cycling and walking for a solution. Um, and, and it's also interesting to note that buses and trams are seen as such a large problem and yet also such a large solution. <laughs> I know that's not the direct uh, focus of, of the FLOW project, but if anybody has any comments about um, you know, contrasting these, these two results, we'd love to hear that from you now. Okay, do we have any hands raised or questions? Uh, we've got one comment um, from William Valim. Thank you very much. Uh, saying, uh, in my opinion, the buses are part of the problem and trams are part of the solution. So mm -hmm. uh, perhaps they should not be in the same category. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to disaggregate that a bit. But that's an interesting comment. So, anybody else have any comments? Okay. All right. Seems we're not getting any in. So, we can take any last comments from our presenters. Um, if you have anything that you would like to um, discuss or, or leave as a final thought, I think we could take that opportunity now to do that.
Uh, but before we launch into that, I just wanted to share one other comment, which is that the sure. present condition of public buses and stations are part of the problem, but with improvement of the fleet, information on the bus stations could be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, another comment received. Okay. Yeah, so the information side. Well, it's also interesting to note, actually, that um, so the public transport option and walking actually has the same percentage. Um, if anybody would like to make any comments about the connection between the two, actually, uh, you know, walking, supporting public transport, or um, anything uh, sort of connecting these modes, or, or how do they contrast with each other in terms of solutions or work together in, in pairs. We can also discuss any solutions that your city has implemented or any ideas that you have. Um, I, I would just hate to state the obvious, but um, most likely to use public transport, um, people have to walk. And yeah. many times those five minute uh, routes that most people take are quite forgotten when uh, planning uh, public transport. So that's also an issue. Uh, I don't know if some of you there work with it, um, but that's walking too. Walking is just not leisure walking. Uh, so when we talk about public transport, walking has to come with it. Mm -hmm. I know Bronon is on that side and she's probably much more eloquent to talk about it than I am, but um, one cannot be dissociated no, from the other. You're absolutely right, Rita. And the thing I was going to add is that what happens, it's a very important point, um, if you go out to start collecting data and want to understand what your mode share and what your uh, volumes of tra movement are in the community, because very often what happens with uh, surveys about movement is that they ask for main mode. And when they ask right. for main mode, it defaults to the motorized mode. So a public transport trip will be recorded as a as a bus journey, but the walk to the bus stop and the walk from the bus stop will not be will not be counted. And then there's a lot Absolutely. of debate about Yeah. And then there's a lot of debate about how long is a journey. Like if you get off the bus and take walk half a block to your building, does that count? How long do you have to travel? How far do you have to travel for it to count as a journey? And you have to look at these in different ways because very often you spend more time walking to and from the bus stop than you do actually on the bus, albeit the distance you travel on the bus is longer, the amount of time spent can be uh, longer on, on foot. And you do need to take this slightly more refined approach to gathering walking data. So I flag that up uh, for listeners that, that it's it's not just about gathering data, but how you gather that data um, and, and picks up on the issues that Rita uh, presented um, very critically. And, and walking is the hardest one because of its integration with modes and its short and long, uh, short distances and longer journey times. It doesn't fit traditional transport assumptions and processes. Mm. Yes. Um, Following up on your comment earlier, I, I would add that uh, I didn't speak much about it, but uh, the political implications of using flow methodology and, and impact assessment tool particularly, um, I didn't expand on that. Um, perhaps if some of you are interested in it, as Brandon said, there's more information about it. Um, if you are a decision maker or if you have to convince decision makers, when you compare how much the CG will save or how much the CG will spend um, by presenting a cost-benefit analysis and, and by bringing soft modes to the same level as motorized traffic, um, it's very important and it's it's very different from what has been done. Um, and uh, well, I think we would be very happy to, to give more information about it if someone needs it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Rita. Do we have anybody who has any comments or questions related to this discussion? Okay. 
Well, um, thank you very much to all of our presenters for this food for thought. And I think we've, we've had an interesting discussion here around um, yeah, applying the, the flow tools and uh, the policy implications for this. Um, if you're interested in more information on this, uh, I can actually take back the, the screen and uh, give you some more information about our e-course. So please just uh, transfer the screen to me. OK. There we go. All right. OK, so um, yeah, I mean, we hope that you found this webinar useful uh, for your work. And again, if you're interested in, in more in-depth information, uh, we have plenty of that to give you over the next four weeks. Uh, we invite you to register for the third and final Flow eCourse. And it opens on Monday, November 13th, runs for four weeks again, so till the 8th of December. And you can work on it in your own time, um, at your own pace. So the course moderators from ECF, from Walk 21, and from Paulus will be visiting the course forum regularly to interact with you and to ask and answer questions. Um, so I can show you now how to actually register. It's actually quite easy. Um, so we encourage you right after this webinar, if you would like to go to mobility-academy.eu and just click on create new account, which is circled here. And then you'll just fill in the requested fields and click create my new account at the bottom. And then you'll receive a confirmation email. So you may need to check your spam folder for that just in case. And you just need to click on the link in the email to confirm your account. And then return to mobilityacademy.eu and log in. Access the flow folder. And then you'll see three courses. So as I've mentioned, this is the third course in a series of three courses. Um, so the only one that will have active moderation now starting from Monday is this third course, putting it all together, the policy context of applying the flow tools. But if you're also interested in more information on flow and transport modeling, looking more in depth at the tools or uh, the overall flow approach, those courses and the content uh, are still available to you but they're not moderated, just so you're aware. So once you've accessed the course, you can just click Enroll Me, and then you'll receive another confirmation email about your registration for that specific course. And optionally, you can follow the link provided and update your profile. But after that, oh, the formatting got really messed up, but once you're enrolled, basically, you can uh, access the course at any time using those direct links um, and this uh, presentation or this information here is actually available also on the Flow website. So if you'd like to see it again, just go to our website, h2020-flow.eu, and then it's the Learning and Exchange page. And you can enroll in the course here, and that's where the uh, instructions are. So. We hope to see many of you there. And if you have any colleagues who are also interested in this, then we encourage you to let them know about the course and they can enroll as well. So at this point then, I'll just say thank you very much uh, to all of you for your interest and participation. Thank you also to our presenters. And we hope you have a, rest good, a good rest of your day. Kristen? Yes. Thanks. Could I just, Thanks, uh, there's one more question about the courses. Yes, um, yeah. Is it necessary to follow the courses uh, one and two first in order to be able to follow course three? No, no, that's not essential. Um, we've set up this course so that uh, you do get a brief intro to flow, um, but you don't need any prior knowledge uh, from the other courses. Um, it's just more for your interest. If, if you want more technical details about the flow tools, then you might want to see the second course, for example. But um, this course can also stand on its own. Perfect. So thanks for the question. Yeah. OK, if we have any other questions, we do have a couple minutes. But otherwise, 
I think we can close out the webinar. Okay. Great. Then thanks again, everybody, and have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.